I wanted to welcome everyone. Hello, I'm uh, Melody Birkins. I'm an adjunct professor in environmental studies and the associate director of the John Sloan Dickey Center and also very engaged with the Institute of Arctic Studies here at Dartmouth. I want to welcome you all to this event tonight. Thank you so much for being here. Um, so this is really fun for me. Uh, as you have read, Dr. Heidi Aklasiak, Aklasiak. I'm not doing your, your middle <laughs> had it. Aklasiak, uh, Sanangatuk, is an Inupiaq scholar and musician currently studying as a postdoctoral fellow in, indigenous studies in the Indigenous Studies program at McGill. But more than that, and I didn't know her middle name as we grew up, um, Heidi has been a friend literally since I was born. She and her family uh, lived right across the road from my family in Fairbanks, Alaska when, when we grew up. And I remember being in awe of her parents' artistic talents. They were known throughout Fairbanks and throughout Alaska and beyond and the world, actually. And her own musicianship from preschool through high school when I sort of lost track after high school. Um, she was always a year ahead of me, a classmate of my older brother. But along with our other neighborhood kids, and names she'll remember, Sharon, Sarah, Gloria, Andrea, <laughs> we had birthday parties, mud pies on driveways during Alaskan spring thaws, and 45 minute long school bus rides on very icy roads on very dark mornings. Because you'll remember, if you've been to Fairbanks, uh, the sun barely rises above the horizon, sometimes deep in the winter. And we'd be on very long bus rides doing our homework and uh, going through our day. So we grew up in Alaska together, then we found different paths and lost touch for many years, because remember, this was mostly pre-Facebook. <laughs> but this summer, and yes, through a Facebook post, I learned she was up at McGill, less than four hours away. And of course, I Googled her. <laughs> she was still an incredibly accomplished musician, and now I learned she was an equally accomplished scholar of indigenous arts and culture. She had graduated from Wesleyan University with a doctorate in ethnomusicology with a focus on Anubiac music and dance. And she was now continuing her research of indigenous peoples, practicing and performing music and dance in urban areas throughout the Arctic. She had years of experience to contribute to the work. She'd received degrees in violin performance for the University of Michigan and the Oberlin Conservatory. She had spent years performing with many ensembles, including the Anchorage Symphony Orchestra, the Louisiana, the Louisiana Philharmonic Orchestra, and the Tulsa Philharmonic. She had also performed at the National Museum of the American Indian in the Classical Native Series and was the first violinist with the all Native American ensemble, the Coast Orchestra, when they performed live music for Edward Curtis's 1914 silent film in the Land of the Headhunters at the National Gallery of Art and the American Museum of Natural History. She was an active performing member, and I'm gonna do this well, of the Kingikmiut. Dancers and singers of Anchorage, a traditional Inupiaq dance group and with ancestral ties to Wales, Alaska, which I understand is this picture here, beautiful, and that shares their performing arts with the community. So I couldn't be more excited uh, to have reached out, now on Facebook, as I said, to invite her here to talk with us about her work. Her work is also, as you know, important and timely, bringing her knowledge and her experience and her voice to issues of culture and tradition of the Northern people through music, dance, and connections to community and history. The title of her talk today is a powerful in itself, and I can't wait to hear more that she will bring to us. It's my sincere honor to introduce my friend, my neighbor, and my distinguished, a distinguished scholar, Dr. Heidi Aklasiak. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Melanie. Pagalagasi. <laughs> Welcome. Koyana Wangataja Aklasiak Sanangituk. Nagurjak Tajatamani Ituni Ublumini. Hello, my name is Heidi Aklasiak Sanangituk. It is good to be here today. Kingak Mugurunga, Asi Kisaving Mugurunga, Asi Pagmapak Montreal Mugurunga. I am Kingikmut Inupiaq. My family is from the westernmost point of mainland North America. But more recently, I am from Anchorage, Alaska. And now I can say I'm a person from Montreal. In Inupiaq societies, it is important protocol to introduce ourselves and where we are from, or more importantly, who we are from, or who we are associated with. Pagmapak Ilisauri Ranga. Indigenous studies, asi ilisaktinga ethnomusicology. Those words don't translate so well. <laughs> Currently, I teach in indigenous studies as the first postdoctoral researcher in indigenous studies at McGill University, and more broadly, I study ethnomusicology. 
Jake Gutani, Imat Nava, thank you very much for bringing your good intentions today. It's an honor to speak with you. So today I introduce to you traditional Inupiaq music and dance from my ancestors and relate what they do to ways in which other Inuit from other parts of the Arctic are expressing persistence, their right to exist through music. I mean for my research to show the world about the richness of our histories and cultures. Yet I position my work as that of an indigenous scholar, not as a source for the broader community or the community at large to practice habits of resource extraction and categorization of cultural knowledge, especially in the realms of traditional versus contemporary music. Indigenous artists and musicians often blur those lines of traditional and contemporary, only because to us, they often exist in the same moment, not as a dichotomy waiting to be dissected, but as equal parts of ourselves and of our ancestors living as one. As Stolo scholar Dylan Robinson suggests, this research resists the tendency to dissociate our dances, songs, oratory, and regalia from their ontological significance as living, sensate, and what he calls their instrumental capacities to do things in the world. In this case, our music acts as a statement of existence. Tamani ituinatut, we are still here. Indigenous peoples of the Arctic use music and dance as a form of cultural sovereignty in the current era of indigenous rights, frequently adapting or adopting non-traditional musical forms and infusing them with indigenous cultural elements. In the current era of potential and realized Arctic resource development, indigenous peoples use music to ac accentuate their connections to their homelands and emphasize the importance of their life ways through public performance. Indigenous peoples use music and dance as a way to connect to a sense of place, to a sense of community, and also to remind the broader community that we are still here. And we continue to maintain connections with our ancestral ways of life, even as transposed into urban landscapes. The King and Commute dancers and singers of Anchorage are an Inupiaq dan traditional dance group that lives in Alaska's largest urban center. To get an idea for who they are and what they do, let's watch a short video of a performance for a semi-private King and Commute community holiday celebration in Anchorage. You can get a sense for their enthusiasm as they perform for themselves, not for a public audience or a tourist audience. about a minute. Yeah, there is an audience of sorts there, but uh, although they are more like 
our relatives who don't dance, <laughs> since it is a King of Mute holiday party. You can see how casual a situation it is. Children are walking around, people are coming and going. I was kind of getting jostled a little while holding my camera. And yet, the group finds a sense of solidarity by singing, drumming, and dancing together. And they have brought this tradition to Alaska's largest urban center and adapted it to work with Western audiences, including their stage setup, which is now facing an audience instead of facing each other, and with their uhlhaq, their ceremonial ancestral clothing, and now in matching colors, purple and teal in this case, recent colors. I'd like for you to keep this example in mind of how vibrant this Inupiaq dance culture is in the present time. As I speak about King Ingmut and other Inuit of the current era and examine oral histories and primary documents of previous eras that attest to the suppression of our cultures in decades and centuries past. King Ingmut are Inupiat whose ancestral homeland is called Kingigan which means the high place, due to the mountain lookout that surrounds the village. It is also known by its colonized name, the Cape Prince of Wales, named thusly by the British explorer, Captain James Cook, from his world voyage of 1778. It is also known as the native village of Wales, as it was named under the US Indian Reorganization Act of 1934 or simply by the short name, Wales. <laughs> that shows how adherent outsiders' appellations can be, as the native name, King again, is known locally by its in indigenous inhabitants. But the name Wales, oops, I went the wrong way, sorry. <laughs> Pushed the wrong side. <laughs> the name Wales appears on maps such as this one made by Google still sticks around. The dance group I mainly work with is based in Anchorage. And as you can see, the cost of getting from Anchorage to Wales can be pretty expensive. And the distance is over a 1,000 kilometers. Although this map is a little misleading because you have to stop in Nome <laughs> and change planes. Um, and there are no roads in this part of the state. Um, the terrain is simply too rough to put in roads. And then if you zoom in a little closer, like this image provided by NASA, you can see the two continents of North America and Asia at the narrowest point of the Bering Strait with Chukotka on this side and the Seward Peninsula of Alaska on the other side. And if you look closely here, you can see the two Diomede Islands in the middle and the international dateline runs directly between those two islands. The Russian, the Russian side on this, on the big diamede side, and the little diamede is the US side of the border. Those islands are about four kilometers apart, <laughs> not very far. And so when you look out across the water from Wales toward the Russian side, you are looking into tomorrow because of that international dateline. <laughs> That's all a constructed reality, of course, constructed by outsiders to the region. <laughs> The current population of Wales is about 160 people, and the population has been as high as 800, or perhaps as many as 900 people in the late 19th century, depending on who you ask or which historian's account you read. This archival image from the Shattuck collection is from 1888. Sorry, it's a little pixelated in this big screen, um, and it shows an abundance of structures and people posing for the cameraman. The village was hit hard by several epidemic diseases, such as the 1918 world influenza epidemic, which decimated the village. This kind of loss took many cultural knowledge holders to the grave, including my own great-grandparents. These are my grandparents, Helen Aklasiak and Willie Sinangatuk, who were both orphaned as children in, the, in King again during that world flu epidemic. And they were taken in care by other families in the community. And as ethnomusicologist Maria Shatla Williams suggests, 
that when there were epidemics that took so many people all at once, it gave space to Christian missionaries who took on new powers in small communities. This new power was because the missionaries brought sustenance in the form of canned foods that helped people survive after big illnesses. And they also brought new Christian philosophies that often discouraged dancing and stressed the use of the English language, all of which greatly affected the cultural landscape in so many communities throughout Alaska. In 1948, my father, Ron Sinangatuk, moved away from the village at the age of 15 when he went to a Bureau of Indian Affairs boarding school. The schools in Alaska were segregated back then due to the Nelson Act of 1905. So Ron attended this new school that had just been opened in a recently dismantled military base just outside of Sitka. He never went back to live in his hometown as happened to so many people who were displaced by the Bureau of Indian Affairs educational policy that took people away from their families and away from their communities at very young ages. I share these stories about King Igmute surviving epidemic illnesses and boarding school situations because the powerful outside influences that took their tolls on our cultural heritage are my personal family stories, not just stories learned secondhand from history books or from news media outlets. As Plains Cree Salto and Pasqua First Nation scholar Margaret Kovach suggests in her work titled Indigenous Methodologies, quote, indigenous people versed in their culture know that sharing a story in research situates it within a collective memory. In this way, I am situating myself and my family stories in a collective memory of colonial suppression of our cultural heritage. They are personal histories that live on in me, yet I exist and persist, and even dance and sing with the King of Mute Dancers and Singers of Anchorage with this knowledge, as do many of our dance group members. Tamani Itunga. I am still here. The King of Mute Dancers and Singers of Anchorage made a resurgence in their practice of music and dance starting in the mid-1990s, influencing the native village of Wales to restart their practice of dance as well. And the village community also restarted their King of Mute Kiryuk Dance Festival, where they invite five to six regional dance groups to visit the village and share in their annual cultural gathering. For the Anchorage-based King of Mute, this festival is the highlight of the year as it allows them to reconnect with relatives and with their ancestral homeland. These oral histories of my family led me to look into historical documents to find out more about the ways in which our music and dance were suppressed in the mid-20th century. I looked into primary documents, including eyewitness accounts presented by government officials, missionary school teachers, and other people who came to Alaska from distant places for adventure and to find their fortunes, such as for the Alaskan gold rush. There was one newspaper article that I found from 1917 that really kind of irked me, one that encouraged Inupiat in Wales and Diomede Island to tear down their kajgit their community centers where dance celebrations often took place. As it turns out, the old-fashioned Kajgi in the native village of Wales was one of the last remaining community houses to remain standing in all of Alaska, even into my uncle Joe Sanangatuk's childhood days, as he attested to in his memoir, Give or Take a Century, from 1971. By the way, this image uh, was taken in the modern-day Kajgi, which is also known as the um, school gymnasium in the native village of Wales. <laughs> they use it as a multi-purpose room for a lot of different activities. Other primary documents I studied not only confirmed the oral histories that I learned from my family members, but also showed me that 
Western society had a penchant for documenting their efforts, of promoting an idea of colonial control over their newly purchased acquisition. In 1867, the United States purchased this territory full of people from Russia. The United States government was unsure of these people's allegiance and even their status as people, as they were indigenous. Eventually, by the 1890s, the United States government began to send American teachers throughout Alaska to instill American values into Inupiat and other Alaska Native communities. One teacher, Ernest Hawks, wrote in his early 20th century report about the tensions between missionary teachers in Nupiak communities and American military installations. Ernest William Hawks was a teacher based in St. Michael from 1911 to 1912 and on the Diomede Islands from 1912 to 1914. He produced some of the earliest ethnographic works entirely devoted to the musical and cultural activities in the Bering Strait region, including the inviting in feast of the Alaskan Eskimo of 1913. By his writing, Hawks seemed to be agreeable to supporting the idea that Alaska Native cultural events should be carried out as usual. But Hawks witnessed the distress of Alaska Native peoples that arose when pressures to stop their ceremonies was demanded by a young missionary teacher. Hawks wrote, but my anxiety to witness the feast nearly came to grief owing to the overzealous action of the young missionary in nominal charge of the Unalakleet. He scented some pagan performance in the local preparations and promptly appealed to the military commander of the district to put a stop to the whole thing. Consequently, it was a very sober delegation of Eskimo that waited on me the next day, including the headman and the shaman who had been hired to make the masks and direct the dances to ask my assistance. They said that if they were forbidden to celebrate the feast on the island, they would take to the mountains of the interior and perform their rites where they would not be molested. But if I said they could dance, they would go on with their preparations. They also asked me to use my influence with the military commander. To this, I readily consented. The young missionary teacher Hawks wrote about had made his concerns about the practice of musical customs known to the military, which from today's perspective, or maybe at least from my perspective, may seem a little overly excessive for a dance festival. Hawks was interested in knowing and understanding the cultural and spiritual aspects of the ceremony and made his wish known to the captain of the military unit. It makes one wonder, why have indigenous music and dance been so severely targeted by colonial for forces. Did this missionary teacher sense that the music and dance might serve a deeper function than entertainment value? So later, Hawks wrote, quote, I found the captain a very liberal man, not at all disposed to interfere with a peaceful native celebration which had lost most of its religious significance and which was still maintained mainly for its social significance as an offering and as offering an opportunity for trade between two friendly tribes. So here, Hawks indicates that Inuit had already adapted their music and dance to reflect social values rather than non-Christian spiritual values, pagan values in his words, it is possible that this adapt adaptation of ceremony to a social activity began as an act of resistance, as a way to evade and to survive cultural su suppression. By finding soft spots in governmental assimilationist policies in order to continue practicing their arts. They called it non-spiritual in order to get past government regulations. In his book titled Indian Blues, the historian John Troutman suggests that Lakota carried out similar acts of musical resistance by the adaptation of their traditional ceremonial dance calendar to fit in with American holidays, 
so they could dance on the 4th of July, on Thanksgiving, and on President's Day as a way of sidestepping regulations imposed by the US government officials that banned indigenous forms of dance. In case you were wondering, bans on Native American dance were not fully lifted in the United States until 1978, when the Federal American Indian Religious Freedom Act was passed, which allowed the freedom to worship through ceremonial and traditional rites. Indigenous peoples persist in the face of opposition to their cultural practices. Ernest Hawke's story doesn't end there, however. <laughs> Subsequent to his years spent in Alaska, Hawke spent time on the Labrador Peninsula of what is currently called Canada. So I've included a map here to show how far away the Labrador Peninsula is from Alaska. In this case, Alaska doesn't even make it on the map. Um, it's over 4,000 kilometers <laughs> all the way to Wales. In 1914, Hawks was an agent for the Geological Survey of Canada. In his associated report, The Labrador Eskimo of 1916, Hawks included a section devoted to music. After he mentions different types of Inuit singing found on the Labrador Peninsula, including drum dancing and women's cradle songs, he makes reference to the musical tradition of throat singing and compared it to a similar type of singing he had heard in Alaska in the years previous. Hawks wrote, among the Alaskan Eskimo, the young girls have a curious type of song which they perform among themselves as a sort of game or amusement. It is called throat singing. Imagine my surprise to read this report, as we no longer have this tradition in Alaska. Well, perhaps in a way, it was also not that much of a surprise, knowing what I do about the ill effects of colonial efforts to erase our cultures. But our Inuit cousins of northern regions of what is currently called Canada are famous for their katajait, throat singing, which has been noted by ethnomusicologists such as Nicole Beaudry, Claude Chavon, Jean-Jacques Natiez, Beverly Diamond, Jeffrey Vanden Scott, and Mary Piercy Lewis, to name a few scholars. And different forms of throat singing have been known to be practiced among Chukchi and Tamir of Russia, as noted by scholars Rayman Naman and Trino Oyama. This type of musicking has been prevalent among peoples across the Arctic regions. But in Alaska, in the present era, as ethnomusicologist Thomas Johnston suggested in his monograph of 1976, it is an unknown art form. So I started asking around. <laughs> in conversation with me in 2015, Willie Nupialuk Topkak, an elder of the Kingy Mute dancers and singers of Anchorage, spoke about how, yeah, they used to do throat singing on the Seward Peninsula a long time ago, but the practice had been lost. The, cor the corroboration between Ernest Hawks and Willie Topcock suggests Inupiat of Alaska suffered a cultural loss of the art of, of throat singing. This loss might be attributed to the pressures from early missionary teachers, government officials, and other influential outsiders who had wished to assert their sense of colonial control and had tried to create some sense of homogeneity among this population they didn't yet understand. I had a feeling that Willie Topcock was pining for a resurgence of throat singing in some sort of traditional manner, as it might have been done in the old days. He is, after all, a traditional craftsman who sews sealskin and reindeer and caribou hide and does beadwork at the highest quality and loves the old ways of its, his elders. Whether Alaska Native peoples will reconstruct the practice of some form of throat singing still remains to be seen. It is not impossible to awaken a tradition that has been asleep for some time. For that, we can be inspired by our Unagach and Sukpiak neighbors who woke their dance and music traditions on the Aleutian Islands after decades of it being asleep after World War II. And how fortunate for me to accept an offer from McGill University to be the first postdoctoral researcher in indigenous studies. I've had the chance to focus my studies with a lens of learning from within, within the context of place, which is so much richer than reading articles or books from afar. 
As I mentioned, throat singing has a stronger presence among our Inuit cousins in northern regions of what is currently called Canada, although they too have experienced colonial suppression of their cultural arts and yet have made a resurgence in recent years. For me, I've been attracted to the work of Tanya Terach, not only as an Inuk throat singer, but that she often works with the violinist Jesse Zubat and Jean Martin on drums, or even with string quartets, or with entire orchestras, and with hip hop artists, and crossing over all kinds of boundaries. Some of you might know about my work as a violinist, and so I'm starting to feel right at home. <laughs> but back to Tanya Tagak. While some may hear her work as throat singing, Tanya Tagak has positioned herself in relation to traditional throat singing. She states, it is a part of a root of what I do, but it isn't traditional, not even close. I don't adhere to the rules of traditional throat singing. I don't like following rules. Instead, Tanya Tagak extends the idea and creates something new, often as a statement of Inuit persistence and providing defiance against stereotypes of being a people stuck in the past. Her fourth album, titled Retribution, from 2016, which, by the way, was up for a Juno Alternative Album of the Year recently, um, this album addresses capitalism as related to environmental issues and demands her presence as an Inuk to be recon recognized, not reconciled. Let's read her text once through before listening to her performance to get a sense of the subject matter. She says, our mother grows angry, retribution will be swift. We squander her soil and suck out her sweet black blood and burn it. We turn money into God and salivate over opportunities to crumple and crinkle our souls for that paper, that gold money has spent us, left us, left us in small boxes, dark rooms, bright screens, empty tombs left investing our time in hollow philosophies to placate the fear of returning back into our mother. Demand awakening for the path we have taken has rotted. Ignite, stand upright, conduct yourself like lightning because retribution will be swift. As you can see, Tagak refers to the oil industry with her words about Mother Earth's black blood beginning to burn. This is something we definitely relate to in Alaska as we have been negotiating oil production and land use rights since the 1960s. And Tagak shows her dissatisfaction in the sense of meaninglessness left with a capitalist society we were pressed to join into, <laughs> left with computers and other screened devices to keep us company. So I'll let this um, excerpt play for a fairly long stretch. Uh, oh, it's some, for some people, it, four minutes feels like an eternity, but it's only four minutes, just so you know. Um, but you can listen to her perform this text and until the part where she starts uh, a little bit of her version of throat singing. And you might listen for the interactions between um, her voice and the instrumentalists, uh, which for me kind of remind me of interactions between pairs of throat singers in traditional throat singing from northern Canada. Uh, so see what you think. Enjoy. Retribution will be swift. We squander her soil and suck. 
felt her sweet black blood and burn it. We turn money into God and salivate over opportunities to crumple and crinkle our souls for that paper, that gold. As musicologist Alexa Woloshin suggests, quote, retribution contains the sounds of an Inuk artist insisting on recognition now for herself and for her people, as a people still alive and thriving despite deliberate attempts to annihilate their bodies and erase their culture. Like Tagak says, the throat singing she does is related to traditional throat singing, but she doesn't like to follow anyone else's rules. Her sounds evoke her Inuit ancestors, but bring the listeners forward into a new space, a new sense of awareness, a new way of looking at the world. This sense of making something new and maintaining the ancient spirits resonates with me as I negotiate the world while dancing with my ancestors. Like the King Mute dancers and singers of Anchorage who are practicing Inupiaq dance and music in, Al in Alaska's largest urban center, Tanya Tagak is also making a statement that we are still here. Tamani ituinaktut, we are still here. We might not practice the form that people from the broader community expect or even want us to do, but we persist. Like King Igmut, Tanya Tagak, in this performance anyway, wears her colorful urihlak, ceremonial clothing that recognizes the ancestors of the past, yet feels like an expression of the ancestors of the future because of its brightness and crisp design. Just as several women of the King Inuit dancers and singers of Anchorage don their kakanyuk, or traditional hand-poked beautification marks, 
also known as tattoos, when once they were shunned by missionaries in our community. Tagak also beautified her skin, at least on her wrists and on her shoulders, as I've seen on other videos. As if to say, we are no longer invisible, these Inuit are demonstrating the processes of being Inupiaq, real people. Tanya Tagak demands her listeners to accept Inuit as they want to exist in the present while simultaneously drawing out the essence of the ancestors of the past and acknowledging the presence of the ancestors of the future. Thanks to the work of our elders, the King Inuit dancers and singers of Anchorage exists as a countermeasure to destructive colonizing influences, as a way to reset Inupiaq ways of being and continually reasserts our existence and identity in a positive manner, especially for our ancestors of the future, the children and grandchildren of our youngest members of our community. In Alaska's largest Americanized urban center, the King and Mute dancers and singers of Anchorage have carved out an indigenous space to practice singing and dancing in the King and Mute way where they continue to practice methods of King Inuit education, composition, making instruments, and making sound. The sounds they make represent an Inupiaq acoustomology, embracing the community in an egalitarian manner rather than by exclusivity. So are there further implications in asserting cultural sovereignty through music and dance for Inuit across Arctic regions? Scholar Lisa Wexler of the School of Public Health and Health Sciences of the University of Massachusetts Amherst works with Inupiaq communities in Alaska on social issues such as suicide prevention and youth resilience. In an article with a title that I just love, and it's called Behavioral Health Services Don't Work for Us, <laughs> she suggests that Euro-American-styled services as conceptualized and implemented based on Euro-American ontology and associated notions of relatedness, personal autonomy, and authority can be antithetical to indigenous ideas, values, and practices. Wexler shows that in contrast, the ongoing uses of traditions to assert cultural identities can play an important role in generating resilience. Well, of course, it's interesting to me to see current research from a Western perspective that is now taking a stance to be, that can be viewed as 180 degrees in relation to these reports from the early 20th century that we viewed before, where there were efforts to eradicate cultural festivals and even the kajagit, the ceremonial ga gathering spaces. Yet this work merely reinforces what we have always known our indigenous ways of doing music and dance are valuable to us, not only as our expressions of cultures, identities, and histories, but as a creation of space or a community of solidarity in healing from colonial efforts of assimilation. If you think about it, those long-term effects of assimilation policies, such as the boarding schools my father and so many others attended, are playing out in all the social ills that the news media likes to focus on so much, the substance abuse, the suicide, homelessness, and joblessness. But we are so much more than that if the news media would only take notice. We dance, we sing, we drum, we make music and art in so many ways that may surprise the broader community. Our sense of persistence is strong. And further, beyond our own sense of resilience, our music serves as political statements within the broader community. In recent years, the King Mute dancers and singers of Anchorage have been asked to open many public events with song and dance, including local and statewide conferences or at receptions for public hearings held throughout the city. By performing their cultural arts throughout an Americanized city that recently celebrated its centennial anniversary, the King Mute dancers and singers of Anchorage participate in this process of an indigenizing the city or making their presence known to the wider community. They connect with the wider community by in bringing a cultural element that may seem unfamiliar for so many people of that community and in doing so create opportunities for understanding. 
Similarly, Tanya Tagak takes her performances of indigeneity on tour to so many places around the world, such as in Canada, Saskatoon, Calgary, Regina, oh, in New York, New York in the United States, Vancouver, Toronto, and Stanford, California, among many other places just this year. She has also drawn much attention with such awards as the Polaris Music Prize in 2014 for her album titled Animism. I intend my research to show the world about the richness of our indigenous cultures. Like King Ingmute and other Inuit before me, I challenge those who are willing to listen and learn to consider that indigenous peoples are not contained by colonial mechanisms designed to rid us of our cultures and of our lands, but we persist, even as we adapt and change with the world at large, just as we have always done. Tamani itunatut, we are still here. Tekutani imatniba, thank you very much for listening and spending your time with me today. I appreciate your presence. Thank you very much. <laughs> We might have. A, I can answer questions if you'd like. I think there's a microphone here as well. Okay. Oh, everybody's so shy here. The throat singing. Oh, like I'll give you your microphone. Sorry. Although he has a pretty strong voice. <laughs> the uh, the throat singing you uh, demonstrated. Uh, is it the same, or does it originate from the Central Asia throat singing? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, and like I said, we've, I mean, it was a complete surprise to me to learn about throat singing in a Canadian governmental publication because we don't have this practice in my community for, I mean, since I was born. So, and, and in fact, the elders don't speak about it, I would say. A lot of people still associate it with, you know, uh, people are fairly well Christianized in Alaska, and it still is associated with uh, um, um, evil, <laughs> I would say it like that. And so people don't even want to talk about it in Alaska. So I, I'm really unfamiliar with it. Um, as far as, I mean, what I know as an outsider to Inuit throat singing in Canada, it seems so very different from what I've heard of Mongolian throat singing. I mean, it's just a different process. Women are mostly in Canada, it's mostly done by women. In Mongolia, it's men, you right, know, and it's yeah. a different thing. It's a different process. There so were I would a group of Mongolian performers here yeah. a few years oh, ago when they did the throat singing. Yeah. So it was different. I yeah, it's wondered. a different thing, I think. Okay. But And so it's kind of sad that we use the same word for describing something that's very different. Yeah. But it's an English thing, you know, yeah. And I think they have each their own individual words in their own languages to describe whatever it is they do. But uh, in a... American English, we just applied this word throat singing, and that's kind of unfortunate in my mind. Yeah, that's a good question, though. Yeah, yeah. Yes, way over here. Thank you very much for your um, presentation. I I was just wondering, because I saw um, Tanya's performance this past spring, and oh, she, um, she was doing some really fascinating interactive work with the film Nanook of the North. Oh, I know. Isn't that um, neat? Yeah. Yeah, and it just sounded like you had, maybe from the introduction, had done something similarly with Edward Curtis's oh, film. Oh, you want to know just, about that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it just seemed like such a powerful way of kind of directly interacting with these early colonial representations. Yeah, so um, um, this was about 10 years ago, 2008. Um, Laura Ortman is a violinist who's based in New York. She's a uh, White Mountain Apache. Um, she had heard about this film, Edward Curtis's film called In the Land of the Headhunters. And um, it had been, somebody had found a box of paper in a library that was, it, this was going to be tossed into the dumpster. And it, I mean, it was a, a musical score and they figured out it was the musical score for this film from 1913 or 1914. I mean, it's an old film by Edward Curtis. And um, in, they, had, they put it together, I think it's, um, I forgot what university orchestra it was in Los Angeles first and then also in Seattle um, because that's where the film is kind of based is in the up northwest coast area and, and so they kind of wanted to bring it home to you know where the film is about. It's about um, Kwakwakawak people. It's in using uh, those people. And so Laura Ortman kind of said, 
why don't we have kind of an indigenous orchestra doing this instead of just a standard pit orchestra? Um, and so she you know, searched around <laughs> the um, internet for classical musicians who are indigenous peoples of North America. And she, we, the 13 of us participated. And it was apparently kind of difficult. A lot of people didn't want to be associated with Edward Curtis. And they just were like, no, I don't want to participate in that. So um, it's a tricky thing. Um, but there was 13 of us who did go and made this little tiny orchestra kind of scrapped together. Um, and we covered all the parts somehow. <laughs> and um, it, there was something like, 13 minutes of score and 26 minutes of film. <laughs> it was something like not enough score. And, and what the previous orchestras had done is they just repeated everything. Um, what we did was there was quite a few people who did improvisation in the group. And so we would play and then uh, our conductor who is wonderful, he's at Eastman School of Music right now and he uh, would just cue. We, we had it kind of organized, and so people would play their thing, do their kind of improvising, and it's it was kind of an amazing experience to be part of this um, little orchestra, this little improvisational group that um, you know made music for this silent film, um, and and we did it in um, Washington D.C. at the National Gallery of Art, and the and then at the um, Margaret Mead International Film Festival in New York City at uh, I forgot where it was located, but um, they had descendants of the original cast members there who are from the Pacific Northwest, and, and it was really amazing to meet them, and, and they were saying they had heard stories from their grand grandparents or great-grandparents sometimes, uh, and they said, yeah, these people who are, you know, in this film, Edward Curtis dressed them up in costumes, I mean, you know, like, traditional clothing and they were already used to wearing western clothing and shoes and so when they had to run around on the beach with bare feet and they said it hurt their feet and you know, they, they said they had heard all these stories and it was quite amazing. Um, Aaron Glass wrote a book about this whole process. It's kind of, if you want to read about it, it's, uh, he's the author He's he, uh, and another guy was involved in it too, I forgot his name, but Aaron Glass is kind of one of the um, guys who put it, the whole thing together. He's, he's really interesting. He wrote a book about the whole experience. Um, uh, there are parts of it on, I think you can watch the video, I mean, not with the score that we did, uh, not the way that we did it. I don't think anyone filmed it. There might be little scraps of it, but not the whole thing. Yeah, that's a good question, too. Yeah. Sorry, that was a long speech, <laughs> but I hope you answered your question. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a musician, but what is the difference between singing and chanting? The woman was singing with lyrics and words. The men in the background of the group looked like they were chanting. The huh. women who were dancing weren't singing at all or saying anything. Is oh, there a were. difference? The women were singing. <laughs> you go to powwow and they're drummers and they chant. But what is singing versus <sighs> dance? Or is it all mixed up into one? I can never tell the difference. Or maybe there's no reason to know. The yeah, difference. there might be no reason to know. Um, to me, those are very much English words that you're saying, chanting. No, not English words. Just things that you can figure. They're telling a story versus chanting. Oh, which is, okay. Which so is a in our Inupiaq, yeah. yeah. Group rhythm versus group story. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Group rhythm versus group story. So chanting to me is a rhythm. Everyone repeats the same rhythm, like um, I can't sing. And where you're singing, when you're singing, it just seems like there's a story or a narrative that is going on of some sort, which the whole group is singing the same type of story versus just a rhythm. I so, don't know what chanting and singing is, if it's the same or if it's different. Uh, well, I'll tell you from my perspective about our Inupiaq dance group, what we do um, generally we'll do a song once through what we call marking, and it's singing it kind of without words. And what ethnomusicologists will call vocables, so just syllables that supposedly have no meaning, but I think they do. Um, and we do it the same way every single time. So it's not like we're messing around with it either. Um, so they're very deliberate syllables. And some people will even refer to our group as Aya Aya. I mean, they actually say, are you going to Aya Aya tonight? I mean, it's like that. Um, and um, then the second time through on the repeat of the song, then they'll add the actual words to the song if they're known. Uh, some of our songs are resurrected and our, our elders, um, you know, they 
remembered our songs from when they were children because, as I said, our songs were suppressed for 40 some years from basically 1946 until the 1990s. And so um, they were children and they remembered some songs and sometimes they didn't always remember the words, the text. So we do songs with just vocables all the way through sometimes, but a lot of songs we do with the actual text. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but this is how we're doing it. Um, and in my mind, the meanings of the songs aren't always in the Western mindset is in the words. It's in the dance motions. You know, this is where you do the storytelling. Um, the, those motions are kind of just as important as words. And so it's when you're trying to put a Western concept on top of an indigenous song, it doesn't always match up because we don't operate that way. And, um, you know, you have to start thinking in the ways of indigenous peoples to understand it's a different system. <laughs> I don't know if that answers your question. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good. Melody has a question. I'll put this down. So I wanted to ask um, it's something that's very important to me in, in, you know, in teaching and bringing, these, bringing ideas to next generation um, and what you are doing too in community. How do, um, what have you found is the right way, is it, it these kinds of presentations, how do we, uh, is it through YouTube, what do you see as sort of the future of making sure the, the waking you've mentioned and the sharing can be most powerful? Is it um, just inviting more? Inviting more. People, real invite. people inviting more. Yeah, I, I would suggest that would be the thing to do. Um, We're doing the and I'm, I'm I mean, I'm doing the best I can. I, it's yeah. hard for me to dance and sing and uh, drum all at the same time. I have not enough hands. I need to be an octopus, so <laughs> I have more hands to do all of it at once. I need to bring a dance group here to do it properly. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe even two people could do it, but um, yeah, you yeah. know, to share something like that, to share a cultural element mm -hmm. from a far off place like Alaska or anywhere else in the world, I would say people is where it's at. I mean, there are people putting up YouTube videos, but I will say that um, I'm, I've been teaching a course about m indigenous musics of Alaska and, and northern regions in general. And in certain places in Alaska, nobody puts videos on YouTube. They just, they're not having anything to do with it. It's their own music for themselves. And they're, they're not participating in YouTube and they for a reason because they don't want it to be stolen. They don't want it to be uh, appropriated by other communities. And, um, you know, they, they're just like, and so it, for me, when I'm running a class, I'm like, well, we're not watching videos from this community today because there aren't any to see. And I'm not, I, and I mean that with all due respect to them because it's their choice. Mm -hmm. And um, they, they are the ones who are in charge of their own culture. And... Um, you have to respect that. So, it, you know, so YouTube is a nice tool, but it's uh, always useful by the people who make it themselves. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if that's helping um, with your answers, but I, that's why I say people, yeah. real people is much more um, useful in my mind for building bridges, right. for understanding, um, because then you can actually talk to people and ask questions like we're doing right now. Thank yeah. you. Do you have other questions? I thought I saw another hand here, yeah. How 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 um, do the youth in Alaska do they participate in dance groups a lot, or is this something that is um, not not really practiced anymore? It depends on communities. For uh, we, I mean, we have about I think sixteen or seventeen dance groups in Anchorage. Which um, I was talking with. Uh, actually, there's an alum from Dartmouth who's here. She's giving a talk now somewhere else on this campus. She's from my community and uh, we're in different rooms tonight. And um, we were talking about that. She's moving to Nome this coming spring and she said there's only two dance groups in Nome and she doesn't belong to either of those two communities and she can't participate. But in Anchorage we have 17, I think, dance groups and um, just because it's a big city. And so people bring their children. Uh, in my dance group, people bring their children and they don't require them they don't make them. It's not that kind of thing. Like I experienced violin. <laughs> make your, you know, make your kids go to violin. <laughs> and I see people nodding about that. Yeah. Um, no, it's not that system. <laughs> um, 
bring people to bring the little ones to dance groups since they're babies and they just hear it they're watching it they're absorbing it even if they're playing on their video games you know what they're they're taking it in and um, over the course of years we believe that they're gonna at some point come to the decision themselves that they're gonna participate and I've watched it myself my cousin has brought her two little girls and now they're like eight and ten and they are they are doing it and they know it because they've been watching it for so many years. And it's, it's really quite wonderful to see that process happening. Um, you know, it's not forcing like, <laughs> like the violin thing. Um, and, it, you know, it's a different system. So, um, I don't know if that's answering your question. Are children participating? I think children are kind of hungry for it because I grew up kind of without a dance community. I mean, Fairbanks, Melody and I were neighbors, which was wonderful. We had a university community, but there was one other Inupiaq family in my whole neighborhood. Uh, it was a university community, and that was it. And so um, it was interesting in other ways, <laughs> I'll say that. We had people from all over the world there. Um, and, uh, but it was a different system for learning in kind of different, you know, I, I did ballet and violin and, uh, you know, that kind of Western university, <laughs> university club situation. So um, it, was, it was sort of a different, different way of doing things. Um, but I, I'm really happy to see the, all the dance groups in Anchorage where people are bringing it. And in the smaller communities, I think they do similar ways of doing that. And, and it's really fun when I go to festivals to see the kids, they, every year they get bigger and bigger and, and they're just growing as dancers and singers. Yes, right over here. I don't know if this is an appropriate question, but you're right across from the Russian Peninsula. Yeah. Are they dancing in ways like you dance? Yeah. So um, in about, let's see, 2011, I went to Nome for, there's a Beringia conference. They, they've started, I don't know, National Park Service has these, I have a lot of grant money for mm, all kinds of research about this area called Beringia, which is the Bering Straits region, basically, where you know, Alaska and Russia come together here. And I, I went for the first time, the, they have a conference on one side of the Bering Strait and then on the other side a couple of years later. So they kind of alternate um, depending on funding. And the first time I went to Nome and they had a group called the Solnichko Ensemble and uh, they were from uh, Uelen, I think, which is on the Russian side. And they're basically doing the same thing, except the thing about it is the women are doing the drumming there because what I found out is the men are busy working and also participating in a lot of alcoholic beverages. And over the, I mean, it's a culture in Russia inside. And so it's a different system. And so the women also participate, you know, they've, they've um, had this colonization in a different form in Russian society there. And so they've had to, um, when they're picking up their pieces, the women are the ones who picked up the drum because no one else is doing it. And so the young children, they brought children with them. I mean, they were young uh, in this group, and they were dancing, and it was quite nice to see. And we have shared songs across the Bering Straits, same song, exactly. And I was like, wow, this is great. Um, and then I actually got to go to Anadir, and same thing. They, um, uh, we have uh, one song in particular that we all share um, called Bering Straits, actually. And um, so it's similar, yeah. Yeah, it's a similar culture across, yeah, yeah. Oh, one question up there. Do we have time? Okay, <laughs> I'm deleting the question. Hi, you said the prohibition on dancing wasn't lifted until 78. Can know, you talk that about that? That really fascinated me. I, yeah, I, I was sort of surprised to read that, actually. Um, I mean, that's just the legal paperwork. I mean, it was also illegal for me to step foot in Boston until the late 1990s, you know, and I was surprised to read that, too, because I'd been in Boston many times. Uh, <laughs> and I was like, oh, I didn't know I did something illegal. And um, so, I mean, it's just sort of laws on the books. And it was President Carter who signed that law, and I read that, and I was like, wow, really, you know? And um, Quite possibly, I, I, I'm, yeah. I mean, I was just a little kid at the time, so I wasn't really paying attention to <laughs> sort of laws and stuff when I was a little tiny kid. But um, as far as what um, I know, I mean, in Alaska, we had 
uh, our Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act of 1971, and that's when people started kind of coming out of the closet as far as all the all the stuff with, that we've been suppressed. We got a law signed by President Nixon, and all of a sudden people were like, "We got a federal law," and they started dancing again after that. I mean, it was like that. Um, they started demanding for uh, military benefits that they hadn't received. They started demanding for public schools at each village so they're not segregated anymore. They started demanding all these things, and it happened, basically. Um, and so a lot of good things happened for us in a way. Some people argue that it could be a lot better, but um, it's, I don't know. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, different um, variants on how you look at it. There's a million ways of looking at it. Um, that's a very good question about the, that law. I don't know too much about it, actually, but um, I just, when I read that, I was kind of surprised. I was also surprised about the law about Native Americans not allowed in Boston until the late 1990s either. <laughs> Old fashioned laws. Well, thank you very, very much. For thank you. Thank you, Dr. Snowcraft, for your presentation. Thank you. So honored to have you here. Thank you, Melody. Thank you all for listening. Thank you, Tony Emanuel.